welcome to all of you. I'm Yudhita Eka Madar, country representative for Europe South Japan. And uh, thank you for joining our event today. It's the European Researchers' Night. We try to organize this event a few times every year, but it's our first time in Kobe. And uh, it's the first time in affiliation with Kobe University. Basically, we try to have European researchers in this particular event who would like to introduce their work and research very briefly. We will have eight minute presentations, uh, two minutes for Q&A. That's extremely short. So uh, we try to squeeze as many researchers into uh, today's event and webinar as possible. So what is this European Researchers' Night? It's basically a flagship event, as I said, we organize it a few times every year. And we try to inform researchers, uh, innovators, practitioners, uh, and professionals about what sort of research Europeans are actually doing in Japan. Uh, we also try to inform uh, the attendees about how they can actually follow in your path. So it's sort of a best practice webinar to show what sort of opportunities there are, um, how you actually uh, got to be in Japan, uh, what sort of research is possible in affiliation with Kobe University. Uh, Kobe University, who is our, uh, who has been our partner for the past four years, we actually uh, signed an agreement with the institution uh, for closer collaboration, and not only in Japan, but also in, in Brussels. Um, they basically uh, organize excellent research programs every single year, and these um, leading tertiary uh, institutions within the university are at the forefront of research, as I said. Let's just see what we'll have about their research insight into subjects in humanities, social and natural sciences in very, very different disciplines and from very different perspectives. Uh, today, uh, I speak a uh, great uh, greeting and uh, introduction of this uh, my, uh, myself uh, as a director of the uh, uh, International uh, uh, sorry, uh, European Africa Division today. So, um, actually, uh, in a core university, uh, there are many uh, graduate schools and faculties, uh, uh, and uh, uh, one of them, uh, there is uh, some faculty of engineering for us, but uh, uh, the uh, student uh, is about uh, uh, 15,000 uh, uh, students and uh, uh, more than 1,000 uh, uh, professors or uh, staff. Uh, so uh, even uh, most uh, people in uh, the Japanese are the, of course international students and uh, staff is uh, uh, exist and uh, mo uh, it's about more than one thousand people and uh, uh, so uh, it's a very uh, uh, they uh, of course you all and uh, they contribute uh, very important uh, research uh, properties. So uh, it's okay. Uh, so uh, this is a uh, status of uh, our university. Uh, so uh, as I said, uh, student uh, uh, fifteen thousand, and uh, uh, there are so many uh, staffs. Um, and the international student is uh, also uh, there are inter uh, international student uh, twelve and. Uh, 1,200, and uh, we uh, collaborate uh, so many in the uh, so many joint research and uh, uh, commercial research uh, as shown this one. And also, uh, we have uh, 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 some uh, uh, global partners. In the, uh, actually, uh, in, the, in Europe, uh, 143 uh, universities we uh, uh, is a, uh, 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 cover some uh, collaboration or some uh, uh, joint uh, joint uh, research, and so of course uh, it is uh, not so uh, much, but. Uh, uh, it is a very uh, inter uh, important uh, partner for uh, Kobe University. So this is a personal international uh, introduction for me, uh, self-introduction. Uh, 
Actually, I uh, begin the international collaboration in 20 years ago uh, with uh, uh, Professor Hua Peo in uh, Kiel University. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a very long, uh, it, uh, uh, a long collaboration we do uh, with uh, that one. And then during uh, 20 years, 20 years, uh, more than 20 years, uh, many times we visited uh, Germany and uh, uh, Kiel University. And, uh, and after that, uh, uh, Professor Falco uh, comes to Kiel University, and uh, of course I uh, visited uh, Kiel University. So uh, Kiel University became an uh, 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 important uh, partner uh, with uh, Kiel University, maybe in the now. Uh, so, uh, so many uh, students uh, visit uh, the uh, uh, Kiel University. Are, uh, during the uh, uh, International Partnership, uh, we have uh, a number of workshops in uh, my field in uh, inorganic chemistry or uh, material science uh, in, uh, in, uh, with uh, uh, we create our colleagues. And not only uh, Kiel and uh, Kobe, but also the many uh, European countries. So I have uh, experience to visit uh, many uh, countries. And uh, during that one, uh, we uh, learned uh, so how to join uh, such uh, communities in, with uh, European peoples. It's uh, very important. And also, uh, sorry, uh, uh, we also uh, personally uh, we visit uh, French or uh, Italian or uh, uh, Germany, and also uh, uh, we visit uh, the Prago uh, for any uh, of the European uh, University. This is a whole uh, alternate uh, partner, uh, partner university. Of the Kobe University, and the Kobe is the uh, uh, most important uh, place uh, for the Kobe University. Uh, and uh, uh, we visited uh, uh, twenty ninety uh, before uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, the, there uh, as a visiting professor to uh, have class and many classes, and also. Uh, we invited the international student last, last year. So uh, even we, uh, not only the research, but also the international collaboration and uh, 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 education. So uh, we, uh, we have uh, contributed uh, to uh, the partners uh, or the, uh, many partnership. So uh, maybe uh, you will uh, continue the research and uh, and uh, some uh, uh, mobilities, uh, uh, mobilities. So we expect uh, the, uh, more uh, uh, active, uh, uh, more activity for uh, your uh, for your experience. Thank you very much. In the first panel, and uh, as the first presenter, we are going to hear. Uh, Patrick Finity, who is Assistant Professor at the Scandal Graduate School of System Informatics. The title of his presentation is How to Make Supercomputers More Accessible. So, as a few students, I'm Patrick Finity, just a, a short climb away at the uh, Graduate School of System Informatics. Uh, don't let my name fool you, I'm actually French. I came to Japan just uh, six years ago, and I've been working as a uh, assistant professor since uh, uh, last year. So my talk will be making some supercomputers more accessible. Um, basically, a short compilation of um, stuff that uh, we've been doing over the last two, three years. So over the last decade, so when you um, like new supercomputers, uh, basically have a lot more available parallelism uh, that uh, we can use. So if you are <coughs> looking at current computers, if you're going to buy your own desktop something, so maybe you'll see CPUs like six, eight cores. Um, for supercomputers or like high-grade uh, 
desktop uh, workstation machines, you now get um, in the tens, like 30, 40, 70 cores right now. So if you ever had the experience of actually writing programs yourself, you know, it's not an easy task. Um, when you have to, you, you have so much parallelism available to you and you actually use many, many computers to break down a large one into several parts and try to get uh, as much performance as you can from the resources that you have. It's actually even worse. And one, well, extra recent topics are also coming on. So uh, with machine learnings and neural networks, uh, we're also um, starting to use, well, not starting, we're actually using now um, GPGP, so general purpose uh, graphical processing unit, which have slightly different architecture. Soon we're going to see uh, FPGA, so the field programmable case arrays. So that will be basically programmable hardware. So there's a lot of potential, uh, but it's not actually easy to create programs that can do a lot of computation really, really fast. So um, my research approach has been basically to put myself as a man in the middle between users that want to compute something and to resources, be it a reasonable, reasonable Beowulf cluster of about 10 computers or a supercomputer like the Fugaku that we have uh, somewhere on your left on the line under the deck. So we're not necessarily uh, aiming for best performance, but reasonable performance and try to make creating programs for just complicated systems easier. So um, as an example of applications that can actually benefit from uh, such high parallelism would be uh, combinatorial, uh, combinatorial searches. So basically you'd have a, some sort of a tree exploration and what you can do is split the tree into subtrees and say, okay, that computer, you're going to compute that part of the tree. And at the same time, another computer is, compute, is going to compute a different part of the tree. So you can make all this computation in parallel and get the results as fast as possible. The problem is um, you can't actually predict how big the tree is going to be. If you could, you would have already sort of computed the solution to your problem. So if, you, if you're not careful, what can happen is maybe one of your computer will finish very, very quickly because well, you've got a small part of the computation, but another one will have a lot of computation still to do. So what you really want to do is to uh, actually relocate parts of the computation as it is ongoing to try and use as many computers for as long as possible. Um, so you can do that. We actually um, um, wrote sort of a middleware that can handle this uh, dynamic uh, load relocation. Um, the basic idea of most of these schemes is basically you have all your computers doing part of the computation a little bit and then check if those around them uh, actually ran out of work. And so you repeat this process uh, until the computation terminates. The problem is, well, sort of the question is, how often should you check if your neighbors ran out of, of, um, of work? Because if you do it very often, you actually spend more time checking if others have work than actually doing computation. So that's not very good. On the other hand, if you very seldomly check, what will happen is some of your neighbors will run out of work and they will wait for a long time until finally someone gives them something to do. So you want to find a balance. The problem is, so in this sort of tree exploration, basically the amount of work is how many nodes in the tree you traverse. And you need to find a proper setting, but it depends on how much computation it takes to traverse one node of your tree. So what we were able to do is to um, actually find some metrics during the execution that actually tell you here your setting is too low, here your setting is too high, and create a, a feedback mechanism which changes the setting as the, the uh, program takes place. So that's what you have here 
on this animation where at first we have purposely a very, very low setting and within just a few seconds, all the hosts just raise the setting to an appropriate range. So with that, you're actually able to get almost the best performance, except for this very first seconds where the setting is bad. Almost the best performance right from the start without having to manually check what possible setting would give you a good value. Um, other thing is you've, if you've already programmed a little bit, you will know that you don't create something from scratch. You actually use building blocks. So typically you have standard libraries that provide you with uh, maps, vectors, arrays, which are uh, what computer scientists use to actually create programs. And these, it's not that they don't exist for distributed computation when you have many, many computers that you want to use at the same time, but it's not, uh, existing works often don't support everything that you want to. So what we did uh, is uh, in, um, in, in, a, in a different project was actually to build distributed versions of an array, distributed, distributed versions of a map, basically having these data structures um, distributed across the computers and to actually make programs easier. So basically with the picture, this is an example of an application that we were able to implement using these high level abstractions. It's um, um, basically a trading simulations. So what you have here is on a bunch of computers, um, tra agents, traders, that based on some market information need to choose, okay, I'm going to sell, I'm going to buy, etc. And they basically place orders based on their, what their choice is and their policy and the current state of the market. And then using these data structures, we're able to gather all of them very easily on one computer to actually match the orders. So if someone wants to sell, someone else wants to buy, if the prices they, they would accept match, we're able to create a trade. And so once trades are created, we're able to, we need to inform back all these traders, oh, you've contracted a trade, congratulations. And update the market information and repeat this simulation. So without these high level abstractions, it would actually be tedious uh, to create such, um, complex programs. Um, now on to some sort of ongoing work. Um, maybe you've heard of Amdahl's law. Um, basically, there's a limit to how much benefit you have from parallelism. So it's, it's a very simplistic model, but basically if parts of the program <laughs> Apparently, I ran out of time. Anyway, there's a limit to how much parallelism you can use. So, when look, yeah, anyway, <laughs> that's not going to fit within eight minutes. But basically, I'm trying to match how much parallelism an application can actually use to how much it needs and try to make it uh, the use of supercomputers, etc., more efficient. Anyway, if there are any questions, I'll be able to take them, but <laughs> this is going to be very difficult. <laughs> Anyway. Um, may I suggest that you, um, if there are no questions, that you explain the remaining slide in the remaining two minutes? Okay. <laughs> later, later. Okay, so we'll take questions later. But basically, um, um, when you submit, a, when you have a program and you want to run it on a supercomputer, you need to decide, I have this program, I want to run it on hundred computers for one hour. So basically what you submit is these jobs in sort of a um, rectangle shape. Submit this to the supercomputer, which is then going to decide when your program is going to execute on which node. So that's what you have here in the middle with a shadow. So there's three programs currently being run on different computers. And so this one, it cannot run because you ran out of computers, so you will run later. What would be great is, say, this white job here, uh, if you could possibly increase the number of computers it is using during its execution and try and make it uh, finish earlier, 
you'd actually be able to run the other jobs that are coming later earlier. So there are a bunch of benefits to doing that, but it's not so easy because creating such programs that could change the number of compute nodes they use during runtime uh, is something not very supported. Anyway, I think I'm really over time, so I pr probably end it here. So uh, you can find me just yeah, just a short time away at the Graduate School of Informatics, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions maybe in a break. Thank you so much, Patrick. I think we could have listened to that for another 20 minutes. Uh, apologies that we really have to curtail the presentations. You're going to hear in the next presentation, uh, the next uh, speech from Romana Nikolova Tsenkova Yordanova, and she's specially appointed professor at the Faculty of Agriculture. And the title of her presentation is Aquaphotomics New Science, Technology, and Educational Platform. Uh, it's my pleasure, really. Um, to welcome you to Cobb University <laughs> and um, to express uh, uh, excitement about what's happening because it's my first occasion, such occasion, to talk to um, people from Europe in English in Japan at Cobb University. Um, just a little bit about, about my, myself and my lab. Um, I came to Cobb University in 1996, a long ago. Um, in 2006, um, I, became, I, I came as associate professor and I became professor in 2006. Um, I established my own lab on uh, biomedical technology. I mentioned in that background. And I retired in 2021, but unusually, we were able to establish a new research field called aquaphotonics. And I'm sure you haven't heard that in this work uh, because it's, um, um, I proposed this in 2005. Um, it means it is a platform, the scientific um, platform for science, technology, and education, exactly. Um, it is all about water and light interaction. Um, light in terms of frequencies, in terms of vibration, uh, frequencies uh, that we can uh, we can measure the absorbance of light at specific frequencies by the water system, the water molecular system. So when we say usually at the moment science is reductionist science. So we have many, many disciplines, uh, tiny, deep, without connections between them in real time. So that does not allow us to have an idea about functionalities of the system. So we need an approach which is a holistic, which is a, um, can look directly to the system functionality, which is impossible at the moment, but by looking at water, which is the, so to me, um, by working with water for so long, um, we realized what is the ultimate sensor and laser. So at the same time, water absorbs light, and by the level of absorption at various frequencies, we can see the, the, the face of the water, means how it interacts with other elements of the system. So it is a collective mirror. So we say for visible light, um, water could be a mirror, but actually what is the mirror for all over the electromagnetic spectrum, all frequencies. So um, I, I made my idea about the Japanese name of for aquaphotonics, which is called Mikodo. Um, do is a way. Shodo, Sado, Nikibai is also. So, okay. So, uh, science at the moment looks at proteins, but uh, aquaphotonics look at, looks at the water around protein and other molecules. 
So, and because we want the molecules to make a network, um, and the, the ultimate sensor means that all the influence by the environment and the surrounding molecules are made changing the, the water structure. Those are different structures of conformations of water molecules. And this is the spectrum of the water spectrum that we work. We work in this area, uh, which is called infrared, because it's easy to monitor the, the water signal at different frequencies. So you can see the, the view of the, the Japanese um, well, exactly transmitted and reflected. So um, we propose a, a way to describe systems by looking at the water. Um, all the, the frequencies that are um, present high variations, we pick, the, pick them up. Um, those frequencies we call water matrix coordinates. And for us, also the letters, the combination of those letters make a, a, a word, a pattern, a spectral pattern, which uh, introduces the system and the condition of, of the system. So we have these sacrograms that we call them the, the face of the water. And by, by looking at the pattern, we know if a healthy a system, a bio system, a biological system, for example, is healthy or not. So these are different cases of different waters. And by looking at the acrogram, so we can we know if this water is dissolving easily or if this water is cold compared to other waters. So we start I started this in, in 1985 with finding that the infrared spectroscopy in infrared light, which is one third, nearly half of the sunlight, can be used to diagnose disease by information. And gradually, so we discovered that what is more important, the water conformational changes are more important than the elements in the water. And no one, until now. So the instruments are normal spectrophotometers, but recently we use very small portable spectrophotometers that you can put on your body and monitor your, your spectrum of, of your water. Uh, and these are, uh, um, so we published last year um, a new book on aquaphotonics that we see online um, many different papers on, on uh, aquaphotonics in different areas. So here I was um, showing the oxidative stress, stress diagnosis, diagnosis and uh, mitochondrial respiration, um, respiration or structural damage of cell membrane. It's a diagnosis disease like primary disease or oxidative stress, etc. Through the water, through the water system. This is this is our lab, and we have um, a regular monthly webinars on aquaphotonics. If you're interested, very welcome. Um, this is how since 2006 in the world the, the citations and papers are increasing. Last year we had 820. Uh, and 2021, 173, only five times more. So now we work on ocean waters and the design of new waters with new function functionalities. Here I end my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Pleasure. There might be questions. <laughs> Yes, there is a question. Uh, uh, let me give you a, a microphone. So, yeah, others could also actually hear what you want to say. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so, I'm gonna, while asking my question, I'll be verifying that I understood what you're saying. Uh, from the spectrum, the near infrared spectrum of water observations, you try to infer. Um, like functionalities, or do you try to like uh, to detect, as, for example, some some disease or some what what information do you extract about uh, the water that you measure? Um, we extract information about the water structural changes oh. caused 
by a disease or caused by different functionalities. It's, we don't, um, of course, we can measure a single, very low concentrations of single molecules, impossible to be measured by other instruments at the moment, just by the changes of the water structure surrounding those molecules. It is a uh, uh, other way around. Not the single molecules, but the water that, because what is very sensitive? Um, one water molecule is very, very small. Whatever is put it in, in, in water, you could measure because it's, it's a multiplicative effect. So it's a network. So you have a, one molecule changes surrounding waters and they change the rest of the water molecules because there's a network. So you have a small single, single uh, sing, uh, signal which is multiplied by the water molecules connected with one another. Another, I didn't talk uh, about coherence in water, but this is the, the phenomenon that explains the networking and the powerful um, effect of amplification. Yeah, thank you very much. I have much more, but I think I'll just leave the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question and also for the presentation. Well, actually, on the network event. Mm -hmm. um, so you will have one hour to quiz the professor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're going to listen to Erki Lassila's presentation, who is assistant professor at the Graduate School of Human Development and Environment. The title of his presentation is Giftedness in Japanese Education. Clashes and conditions for harmonious coexistence. I don't think there's need for any more introduction, but um, I'm Erikiti Lasila and I originate from, from Finland, which is quite famous here in Japan for the, um, uh, what people do think of excellent education. I have some uh, gripes with that, but let's not get into that. Um, I did not start with gifted education. Uh, when I was doing my doctoral studies, I was looking at beginning teachers' work as relational and emotional practice and focusing on it as cultural and institutional practice. I did my um, data collection in most of the uh, actual field work in, uh, in Hokkaido University, but the thesis to University of Oho. Uh, after that, I've been looking at teacher education and teachers' professional development, so focusing on teacher. Uh, thinking and learning in quite wide sense. Uh, um, in, in my thesis, I ultimately dealt with tensions um, in beginning teachers' work and teachers' work in general. So I came to Japan a uh, second time during 2013 uh, when I had been studying Japanese for eight, eight years, I think. And after that, I went um, back to Finland, but came back again in 2020, just before the corona broke out, to uh, look at the local gifted education situation. Um, because there are a lot of similarities between Japanese and Finnish system. I wanted to see uh, what the teachers think about uh, gifted education, what's the gifted educational context and uh, ecosystem here in Japan. And as, as part of that, I'm also looking at STEM education and science education, because it turns out that quite a lot of what can be labeled as gifted education here in Japan falls under uh, either of those, those umbrellas. So I was in Ava University before, um, being appointed here in, in Kobe University. Uh, I published two research, one in Japanese and one in, one in English. So, uh, the Japanese one dealing with the super science high schools that can be classified as uh, gifted education um, locations. And then we've done an examination of um, uh, pre-service teacher thinking about giftedness when they're facing gifted students in inclusive classrooms. So those uh, feature in the presentation. And there are um, programs and different kind of uh, activities um, aimed for a gift that even though it doesn't yet exist as an official thing here in Japan, um, the Ministry of Education has had quite comfortable, uncomfortable relations with that. They're about to include giftedness uh, in a very roundabout way into the new Kakushu Shido Yori, the study program. But there are um, programs uh, aimed at kindergarten uh, eight students, elementary students, uh, and high schoolers. Um, then, then you ask, who are the gifted? There are many definitions, and there is not a consensus in, in the research field on who should be labeled as, as gifted. So I've decided to use a more practical 
um, definition put out by Silverman and Matthews and Foster, looking at gifted students as being developmentally advanced in one or areas and then uh, being in the need of differentiated programming in order to develop a teacher on accelerated phase. So it's kind of situational depending on the context who can be uh, just to be developing the advantages and looking at the mismatch between what is educationally provided in the in the a given setting and what the students need. So usually there is a mismatch, mismatch between um, the highly gifted students and what the regular curriculum and school education provides. And then we need to look at uh, how can we create a system when, when this thing takes place, what kind of barriers exist. Uh, usually you focus on something as uh, the flexibility and transformability of the curricular system, uh, different kind of educational intervention, teacher attitudes, uh, teacher skills, competencies and so forth. Um, uh, right now I'm in the process of finding ways to create a Japanese model for education teacher about gifted, gifted education, gifted and their needs, finding competencies and good practices. So part of that is looking at international theories, uh, models and practices, looking into Japanese discourses and ideas about giftedness which don't necessarily exist as uh, labeled as such but are uh, present in different kind of practices and all around the culture. Then more explicitly looking at um, the kind of practices and um, thinking the Japanese teachers who work in the field have. Um, I'm doing teacher, teacher um, in interviews, looking at educational documents, prior research, and so forth. And there's actually a branch out in the more practical realm where we're <clears throat> planning a three year uh, teacher training program on keeping this that should start um, April next year if we can get enough teachers to, to participate. Um, there's a Japanese conundrum which first got me interested about Japanese gifted education. How can they produce excellence within a system that has a strong Italian egalitarian ethos and um, quite heavily uh, emphasized common learning base? So you have uh, Nobel laureates, uh, high level um, technology coming from Japan, international development artists. I think uh, it, ultimately my research should go back to the formal education. Uh, the school system, which usually is split between public and private, but in most cases, I think up until today, the, the gifted or the really talented, uh, eminent people have risen not because of the formal education, but despite of it. Um, and because of that, I want to look also for non formal education, um, meaning the kind of structured and goal oriented um, ed education that may give out certificates but it's separated from, from the school system. So you look at prep schools, what it happens with Ninju and different Naraikoto um, workshops, summer schools, and the master apprentice system presented in traditional arts because I think that can be quite um, uh, illuminating when it comes to Japanese understanding of how you develop talents. And there's obviously informal education, different opportunities for enrichment, personal learning that exists plentiful in Japan, but teachers might not, may not be aware that these are available within the ecosystem of uh, education. Um, some um, difficulties in the cultural and educational environment, the school curriculum and school policies tend to be quite inflexible, which is a, a big difficulty. You tend to put group before the individual, which makes it more difficult to uh, do individualization, differentiation within um, the teacher's practice. It's more important to be superior to others than excellent. So as long as you're the first or among the top, it's good enough. So you don't need to be on the top, although that can be contested. Um, there's anxiety avoidance, so you don't want to do something that others have not tried. So there's a limit to how creative you can be and different things. There's a lot of emphasis on Toryoku, uh, on uh, um, putting in the effort instead of focusing on the innate or um, natural born talent. Um, you need to proceed in education at uniform pace, so, so you don't, you, it's really difficult to uh, implement something like uh, taking, um, skipping grades and things like that, which are commonly done in gifted education. Uh, there's opposing attitudes because you want to keep everyone at the same level, so you don't want to give the gifted special attention. Um, but there are plenty of opportunities for enrichment outside the school, like I said, there's the kind of culture where you can develop your skill to the extreme in your chosen field, the kind of thinking of something that you've chosen to do as, as Michi. Um, and then when you choose your path, you tend to persevere in it, so even if you're reluctant at first, you can find out it becomes your 
um, not a life goal. And there's also educational competition that is promoted, especially the Japanese where it says that Akuma, which is kind of like a friendly competition when you're trying to uh, outdo each other in a, in a friendly manner. So those kind of things also, um, the, the ones highlighted in yellow are the ones that make it so that uh, gifted education can happen in the Japanese system. It's also a matter of choosing the right kind of paradigm, the, the theoretical background of thinking. Typically, gifted education, you have the gifted child um, paradigm where you think that the gifted form a special category of a unique group of people that you need to separate from um, the other learners, make a special programs, use some kind of psychometric measures to um, make sure that they have superior mentor qualities and then um, you make programs that are uni uni uniquely suited on them. Those are something that cannot really be done in Japanese system, but if you go to uh, the de talent development side where you're more, more, more focused on the diversity of the talents, um, we get more domain specific, specific, for example, in the science, education, arts and such, um, which aligns quite well with the Japanese idea of putting in the effort and um, practice being the key. Okay, I'm not running out of time. Um, yeah. I, I think this was the last slide anyway, so I'll stop here. Thank you. It's looking great. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this event. And I'm really sorry that I cannot be uh, with you in a room tonight in, in Kobe, but I hope to meet all of you at some other occasion in person. Uh, just a short introduction about myself. Uh, so my name is Ivan Romic, and I am a specially appointed assistant professor at Center for Computational Social Science. And I joined Kobe University at April last year. Uh, before that, I was for some time in Tokyo and also in China. And before China, I was doing my PhD in uh, Osaka City University. Uh, and my field of research is uh, evolutionary game theory and human behavior. So here I, I will briefly introduce uh, my field of research, and then I will show some of the work that I do in this field. So I would like to start my presentation with a with a short story about the uh, Ik people in northeastern Uganda. So I don't know if any of you is is familiar with this story, but uh, in the 60s, anthropologist Colin Turnbull he spent uh, some time with uh, with the Ik people. And he wrote a book about their way of life, which became a bestseller. So why this book became a bestseller? Well, some of the things that he observed there were quite shocking to, to modern or Western society because Ik people were living uh, in an extremely individualistic way. So uh, uh, here on the slide, you can see some uh, different ways of uh, their life. And I would just like to point out, for example, that uh, children are minimally cared for by their mothers until age of three, and then their mothers would abandon them. Uh, and then by age of three, uh, kids are basically expected to find their own food and shelter. Uh, and in general, uh, people would marry just to build a house together, but they wouldn't live together or they wouldn't spend time together. And if they meet in that house, it was mostly by accident. So these two and numerous other examples caused a fascination in the, in the developed world because uh, people were basically shocked that we as humans can live in such an extremely individualistic way. But uh, one of the consequences of, of this book was that uh, the people of Ik were quite vil vilified in the, in the Western uh, society. So here on the left side, you can, you can see some examples that for example, in 1970s, the New York Times article described them as haunting flower of evil. So that was very uh, mean thing to do. And uh, in his famous book, uh, Richard Dawkins used the uh, people of Ik as an example of selfish human culture. But okay, these things are from 70s, but we can see that even relatively recently, in 2016, uh, the best-selling authors were still using them as an example of kind of bad or evil society. And of course, this also caused lots of problems uh, because uh, it was now difficult to justify uh, why to help to those people because they are living, living in poverty. So if uh, international organizations want to help them, 
some other people were saying like, well, we shouldn't help them because they are extremely individualistic and that help will be of no benefit for them. So in a way, this caused lots of racist interactions towards big people. But uh, in 2020, uh, the research showed that basically Ik people are equally generous as other people, or in some conditions, they were even more generous than people from other cultures. So basically, uh, we got the completely opposite situation of something that was accepted as a fact for decades. Uh, and this happened because, and uh, if we ask how researchers find out that uh, the Ik people were equally uh, pro-social as people in other cultures, well, they used economic games. Basically, economic games are experimental and observational tools which are used to study various behaviors. And even though they are called economic games, they are also used in psychology, sociology, but even evolutionary biology and physics, because all of these fields are in one way or another interested in human behavior. And it's, it is important to notice that these games involve hypothetical scenarios, but depending on the performance of player, they will get some real rewards. So often players will actually get the payoff in real monetary units, depending on their results in the games. Uh, so in the, in, the, in the generosity among Inc of Wakanda, the authors used the dictator game, which was designed to measure generosity of, of people. Uh, and here you can see some examples of economic games. Of course, these are maybe the most popular games, but there are so many others. And of course, we cannot go deeply into these kind of games. But I will just briefly show you some details about social dilemmas, since they are the most famous uh, games. So uh, maybe you heard about social dilemmas, and especially about prisoner dilemma as the most famous social dilemma. Basically, there are games with two or more players in symmetric roles who independently and stimulously decide whether to cooperate or defect. So the most important part of such dilemmas is that cooperation increases social welfare or the total outcome of all players, and it is collectively beneficial. But at the same time, it is decreasing players' own income. So we are having coupling of individual against uh, collective uh, behavior. And or if we're using evolutionary theory language, uh, social dilemmas are situations in which the process of selection favors the faction over cooperation while reducing population welfare. So you always need to keep in mind that these are situations where individual welfare is in conflict with social welfare. And just to briefly show how, how these games are set up, basically we have a payoff matrix with four variables called the reward, temptation, suckers, payoff, and punishment. And depending on the values of these variables, we can, we can uh, set up different types of, of games. And of course, these games are slightly different and they are used to study uh, slightly different types of, of dilemmas or problems. Uh, so basically now we are coming to the, to the work that I actually, people in this field actually do. So since we have a conflict between selfish and collective behavior and a famous Nash equilibrium or mathematical model, which is designed to study this, says that uh, equilibrium is selfish behavior, but obviously cooperation exists in society. So basically we are looking for uh, cooperation promoting mechanisms. And they are in, and this field is quite, uh, uh, it's, been, it's quite famous, let's call it like that, for the last few decades. So of course, there are many different types of behaviors, but maybe four main ones that we, we, can, we can outline are uh, kin selection and three different types of reciprocity. Basically, kin selection means that uh, organisms which are related will be pro-social to each other. And with kin selection, we can explain most of pro-social behavior in, uh, in natural world. Of course, when it comes to humans, we are uh, relatively unique in a way that we cooperate with the non-kin. So we cooperate with other members of society who are not related to us. And this is, uh, this is studied by concepts of direct reciprocity, indirect reciprocity, and network reciprocity. So my, my work falls in an in a, in a area of network reciprocity. So basically, networks are a way to make our experimental setup or to make our model more realistic. So basically, uh, we are giving to the uh, people who participate in our experiments some structure. And this structure is used to imitate the real world structure. And here you can see uh, examples of various and different networks, which are, uh, if you start from a uh, lattice grid, and then networks are getting more complex and more realistic. So of course, depending on what is the point of your research, what is your goal, you will apply a different type of network. 
Uh, and here you can see example of a, of a game theory game of prisoner dilemma on a lattice network where you have, a, for example, a focal player and he interacts with four of his neighbors because lattice network is basically a regular grid network. Uh, and here you can see some of the so recurrent project I'm working on is that we are applying not only prisoner dilemma, but trust game and ultimatum game. We are uh, setting them on network and basically making these games more realistic because standard way to do the experiments is to have every player interacting with each other, but that's not realistic because in society, some people interact only with one part of society, other people inter interact with another part of society. Uh, um, you have already used up nine minutes, so uh, I'm afraid you'll have to cut it a bit short. Thank you so much. So, 10 more seconds. So, these are just some results that you can see the example of analysis that we do, where we have our control treatments and then various treatments where we are including our mechanisms. Uh, here, we extract some behavioral phenotypes from data. So, for the final slide, I would just like to say that key key. Maybe key message of this short presentation is to keep in mind that all of life is social. So from microbes to organisms to humans, there is social behavior everywhere. And basically, uh, researchers from different fields are studying and everyone is using game theory. So it's a very wide encompassing field. And I hope at least you could get, you could get uh, some idea of, of what we do from this short presentation. Uh, this slide we can skip. And thank you very much. And these are some information. About Thank you so much. Thank you, Ivan. That was a very informative presentation. And uh, indeed, game theory and prisoner's dilemma and all these social games are always fascinating. Um, we really wish you were here with us so we could actually <laughs> hear your perspectives during the networking session, but maybe next time. Thank you for having me. Bye -bye. Let's, uh, let's proceed. Uh, Christopher Chaletta. And he's a specially appointed assistant professor at the School of Languages and Communication. The title of his presentation is On the Importance of Love on the Process of Personality Formation in German and Japanese Bildungsromane. Okay, so I'll just uh, share your slides. Sure. You can get a microphone in the meantime and maybe. Yeah, I'm just going to start talking. Thank you very much, very much for the introduction. Uh, yes, all life is um, social, and uh, the best form of social interaction is uh, love, I think, and that's what my topic is about. Um, I am a special appointed assistant professor at the SOLAC, it's the School of Languages and Communication over at the uh, first campus. And I did my BA and MA in Germany in Japanese literature, and then I did my PhD at uh, K University in German literature, uh, which means um, uh, uh, I mostly do um, comparative literature. And in my PhD thesis, I compared um, German and Japanese literature. In, I compared the uh, Bildungsroman. Now, Bildungsroman is one of those very uh, few loan words uh, in English that come from German. Uh, but since not everyone here today is either German or the literature, um, I want to explain it. Now, Bildungsroman, Bildung means something like character formation, and Roman means novel. So it's a uh, novel about um, how the um, character of a uh, protagonist is formed during formed during the uh, novel, um, if possible in an idealistic way. So that's how the author would show how um, character formation actually works. And this is obviously very different um, between the cultures and between uh, the the churches of each country. And um, yeah. One of the findings of my PhD thesis was um, about the role of love in either Japanese or German Bildungsromane. Um, if you look at German Bildungsromane before the Second World War, you can always see that um, love is considered to be very important for um, this educational process. Um, the most famous Bildungsroman is um, Goethe's Wilhelm Meister's apprenticeship. 
and um, it is considered an archetypical Bildungsroman and a model for a subsequent uh, Bildungsromane. Um, here, love and his companionship with women is considered very important for uh, the unfolding of the Lehrmeister's um, educational process, um, process of character formation. Um, now, at the beginning of the novel, Wilhelm loves the actress Marianne, and she is later to bear his child. And then he meets the girl Mignon. She is only 12 or 13 years old, but nevertheless, there are some um, romantic and even sexual allusions. For example, she tries to sneak into the Hellmeister's bed, uh, but she fails to do so because someone else was faster. Uh, the actress Billy was already in her bed when she <laughs> wanted to go in there. And um, then Mignon, the girl, she dies of grief when Wilhelm kisses another woman, uh, Therese. And uh, later, uh, during the performance, um, Wilhelm Meister sleeps with a married countess. And then at the end of the novel, he marries the sister of that countess, the Baroness Natalie. So as you can see, there are plenty of love interests uh, for Wilhelm Meister. And this is not the only novel in Germany where love is so important for character formation. Um, for Goethe himself, he's still the most important German writer today. Um, of course, intellectual study was important for um, character formation, but also so was feeling and uh, emotions and uh, well, love, obviously. Uh, Goethe wrote, uh, dealing with women is the element of good manners. And um, as I said, um, with a master's apprenticeship, is not the only uh, Bildungsroman that thinks like that. Now, how about Japan? Um, let's look at some Japanese Bildungsroman. The first Japanese Bildungsroman I looked at in my uh, PhD thesis was Dr. Tomoe Loka's Footprints in the Snow. And uh, here, the interaction with women is seen as an obstacle uh, to male self-development and um, the protagonist does marry at the end of the novel but only because marriage is a sign of success and also because the author Dr. Miroka is Christian and he thinks that um, marriage belongs to a successful uh, educational process. Um, the next novel I looked at was uh, Youth by Mori Wogai. Um, in this novel, Mori often refers to uh, the theory of the Austrian um, writer Otto Weininger, who was a terrible misogynist. And uh, in this novel, women are only um, motivated by their sex drive and the uh, male protagonist must emancipate himself from the women um, to get rid of their allure to be productive himself. Then there is uh, Santoro's Diary by Abegido. Um, this book is kind of manifesto for the study of the humanities. Um, for him, the most ideal way of um, Character formation is reading, yeah? not uh, human interaction, not love. Um, that's for him a waste of time. Read the classics, read the humanities. Uh, that's the ideal way of character formation. And um, yeah, real life experiences are not important for him. Then we have A Pebble on the Roadside by Yamamoto Yuzo. In this book, um, the protagonist decides against an ideal relationship with a girl um, because he thinks it would hinder his uh, personal career and his self-development. Then there is um, Asunado Monogatari by Inoue Yasushi. Uh, here, women are perceived as an obstacle by men, and the protagonist is, is um, surprised when he meets a woman 
who is, I quote, pure, which means who is not motivated by sexual drive. Now, there are other novels I could use to show that love is not considered important in a Japanese Bildungsroman. Um, and I think not only is this um, for the Japanese writers, is, is love considered irrelevant, it is even viewed as a hindrance. Now, um, here you can see the uh, kanji for hindrance, uh, samatage, and you can see one of the theoreticals, the, the part to the left, that's uh, the radical of the woman. So the um, woman is part of the kanji for hindrance. And I thought this was very symbolic. And um, yeah, the this difference between Japanese and German um, Bildungsromane, that love is either seen as beneficial or as an um, obstruction, um, is the first interesting um, research result, I thought. Um, but of course, you have to ask for the causes. Um, the Japanese writer Sakaguchi Ango, he wrote in 1941, I quote, I think today more than ever, the idea is alive that love is understood as a disturbing desire and immoral. This fact cannot be smiled at and dismissed as an innocent anecdote of yesteryear. Now, he wrote this in 1941. Uh, that's already where the situation improved. I think around 1900, it was even um, considered worse. Um, now, why does love have such a bad reputation in uh, pre-war Japanese? Um, first of all, this um, assessment is counterintuitive and contradicts the contemporary consensus or even common sense, I would say. The ideal viewpoint here would always be to put love about career, um, but that this cannot be dismissed uh, so easily can be seen from um, uh, the Japanese or in, in general that um, the, the uh, dilemma of women to, have to, to choose between uh, career and um, family. Then another approach would be to um, look at the personal views of the author, but that doesn't work because actually all the authors thought like that, so it has to be in some kind of mentality then um, you can just look at the general misogyny of the time and that is a fact and that certainly um, had an impact on the production of novels and last two types um, last two reasons are that there were two types of japanese films online in the pre-war period and one of them is the so-called what well, i call it like that uh, the success uh, Bildungs Roman. Um, it has to do with a um, way of thinking in um, Japan at the time called Vishin uh, Shusei the rise up in the world uh, kind of ideology. And here, only um, personal um, efforts, your personal career was important. Now, um, this way of thinking seems egoistical, egoistic first, but actually this kind of um, you can also do it for society as a whole, so it becomes altruistic as well. Then there's the idealistic Bildungsroman here. It's, um, I already uh, named um, Abisido's uh, Santoro's Diary. Um, here, only the studies of the humanities is um, considered uh, important. And um, that was the last uh, reason on how I wanted to explain the phenomenon on why uh, in Japan, love is considered a hindrance to personal uh, development in Japanese business online. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Michele Riminucci, Associate Professor at the Graduate School of Law. She will discuss 10 years of research on labor law in Japan. Okay, so Michaela, let's uh, share. Again, those of you who feel that you need to grab a, a glass of drink, please uh, do so. And while we prepare your slides, then. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, as I was said, my name is Michaela Lynch, and I work here in Kobe University at the Graduate School of Law. 
uh, Faculty of Law and Graduate School of Law. Uh, this is actually the first time for me to uh, participate to, to actually present the presentation at this uh, European Researchers Night, although I've already joined the Euraccess events. And by the way, I want to thank uh, Judith and Euraccess, of course, and also for the University Institute for promoting international partnership for organizing this event. And considering the time constraints, <laughs> I'll try to be short in my presentation. I won't go too much in detail on my research. I hope we will have time later uh, to discuss it more with people who are uh, interested in that. Um, but so starting from my research, what do I do? And what I have been doing um, in really in a few simple words, because otherwise it will become too long. Um, my field of research is uh, comparative law and specifically comparative labor law. Uh, so what I do is uh, to compare different legal systems and find the differences and similarities between them and especially um, analyze the reasons for such differences uh, considering the current situation of globalization of law, which means that uh, legal principles nowadays um, travel so much more than in the past uh, across countries. And so for my point of view, from the point of view of comparative law, it is interesting to uh, study uh, how they are applied uh, all over the world and if there are differences, what are the effects of, of uh, these laws. Um, and um, so for my research, comparison is actually a method um, and it's aimed uh, specifically at studying different solutions to similar problems and in the end, hopefully, uh, formulate policy proposals. So the uh, idea of comparative, comparative lawyers like me is not just to compare in order to kill time, um, but to compare in order to uh, study how different legal systems have found solutions to similar problems, how they work, and how to improve uh, uh, the legal system in uh, a certain country. Uh, of course, as you can imagine, since I'm comparing different countries and specifically I'm comparing Japan with the European Union and all, all member states of the European Union, such as Italy, which is my, uh, my country of origin. Um, there are, uh, law is not, is not the only uh, thing to take into consideration. There is a strong influence by culture. And, uh, and also, it is important to look at interdisciplinarity. So, especially for labor law, uh, economics and, and, uh, becomes particularly important. And these are my publications. I will, of course, I will not go through all of them, but as you can see, especially in the most recent years, I have been dealing with the impact of COVID, COVID-19 on labor. And in particular, as uh, maybe we can discuss also later, uh, what happened is that COVID actually made existing issues worse. Uh, so actually highlighted the uh, uh, weakness of certain laws, especially in the field of anti-discrimination law, which is my uh, main field of, I mean, topic of research. And, and so what I did in recent years is to try to understand more about this phenomenon. And what I intend to do from now on is to study about it not only from the point of view of law, but in cooperation with other researchers. Um, uh, like uh, now I'm cooperating with the sociologists, but in the future I think I will do something also with the uh, economists, the rest of the populations. And uh, just to give you, since I, I mean, this event I think is also aimed, as, as it was said in the beginning, to kind of uh, uh, give an example of how people can, uh, for example, work abroad or in Japan. I will give you just a few, uh, uh, just say a few words about my career here in Japan, how I ended up in Japan, and uh, how I developed, why I developed my career in this way. And uh, actually, as you can see, um, uh, I've, um, I have a double major, we can say, because I have a bachelor's degree in Japanology, so area studies. Uh, and but I also have a bachelor's and master's degree in law, uh, both of them in Italy, and then I continue with my PhD studies here in Japan on the topic of comparative law. So already my education was kind of interdisciplinary. And then about work, um, uh, what I've been doing is actually not only my main job is as an academic here in Korea University. 
uh, but over the years they will also get uh, a few, let's say, side jobs. Um, for example, I'm a translator for Japanese to Italian. Uh, and I've been doing this for years, and uh, it has actually given me some insight, cultural insight that it is useful also in my research regarding uh, labor law. And at the same time, I also uh, still work uh, as a of counsel, so consultant for international law firms. Uh, and this too is connected to my field of research because I deal with um, corporate law and labor law. And in studying Kobe University, apart from teaching in the beginning, I was actually involved with the Compass program, so the Kobe University program for European studies. And so I was teaching in English and Japanese. I uh, know mainly in English, uh, EU law and the comparative law, and, but then also anti discrimination law, which is my topic of research, also a about Japanese law and even English. Uh, but in recent years, I became uh, also coordinator uh, for uh, interdisciplinary programs. So, first, I uh, was involved with the Econo Legal Studies graduate program, which is an interdisciplinary program between uh, the Faculty of Law and the Faculty of Economics. And more recently, um, I have been uh, cooperating with Kobe University as coordinator in order to uh, establish a new program called KIMA uh, that will be interdisciplinary between faculty of law, economics, and business administration. And in recent years, I only teach in Japanese, actually, but uh, with this KIMA program, I will move back to English, uh, English and English as well. And so about the membership, since I was told to talk about this, um, I am also a founding member of the Association of Italian Researchers in Japan. I don't know if there is an Italian here today, maybe not. Looking at their faces, people know. Uh, but uh, uh, so yeah, but if there is any, if you know any Italian go university, let them know about me, maybe we can, we can talk about the association. And then, of course, I'm also part of, of other associations related to, to my research. So, area studies, Japanese studies, and then comparative law and labor law. How much time do I have? I don't know. My final. 20 seconds. I don't know more. Okay, <laughs> 20 seconds. So, final remarks uh, just to uh, put it to understand what kind of researcher I am. Um, for me, research is not only. Maybe I'm not that so much of a traditional researcher because uh, I have these different inputs coming from different fields, from especially practical uh, fields, so uh, being a consultant, being a translator, and of course also teaching, especially in recent, in recent years, uh, in which I've been involved with the interdisciplinary program. I try to put all this uh, as, uh, as, a, as much as I can in, in my research, and especially in recent years, to develop interdisciplinarity. And that's it, I think. And the time is up. So thank you very much for listening. Okay, so uh, I'm Tristan. I haven't included anything about uh, myself, but I, I'm going to tell you a story and I'd love to talk about myself more. So like, please feel free later. So this is a simple narrative I like to use to explain my research. Um, until a few years ago, machines could not see. Now they can. So what? And so I'll go through that narrative to try to explain my field and maybe loop a bit on what I do every day. So until a few days ago, machines could not see, now they can. So what is vision? Uh, vision, vision is what your brain do when I show you this image. It instantly and effortlessly extracts a number of information. You're, you recognize a dog running towards you. Um, you estimate its speed, uh, its emotional state, the danger it represents to you. You do all this information extraction from just one image. But one image is just like a grid of number. You can think of it as a matrix that gives you the intensity of color for each of the image. So that's what it is to computers. Cameras record the light and store it in that fashion. And this is what is done by our eyes in ourself, and vision is the work of the brain that extracts from the light patterns the different information. Okay, so the way we do that uh, in computers is you can see computer vision models as a mathematical function that attributes to a matrix some information that can be 
this is a cat, this is a dog in this image, or it can be a number. This dog is running at 10 kilometers per hour. So this is the kind of way we can phrase extraction information from visual signals. There are also like more complex problem formulations we can do. Like I can ask where are the eyes of the dog, and you would find that kind of in those boxes, you would find the, the location information. And we have also like things we would call segmentation that is attribute one label or one information to each of the pixels in the image. So coming back to what vision is, if you try and think of what those uh, this information we have extracted with our brain is, it can be kind of like addressed by those simple problem formulation. Recognizing that this is a dog can be a classification problem in which you just associate one label to that image. Um, inferring the depth can be kind of giving a number to each of the pixels. This is one meter away from me or something like that. So until a few years ago, computers could not see. Uh, now they can, so what? So from basically just the birth of computing, digital photography, we've been trying to extract information from visual signals. And up until the early 2010, we were really bad at it, asking, asking what is, uh, is it a car or is it a dog to a computer? It was very difficult to answer. Uh, we had low accuracy. In the early 2010, we had this thing called deep learning, which is carrying the new uh, AI wave that's starting to surpass human at answering more complex questions. And from then on, we can extract information with much more granularity from images. And today we do much more complex stuff. Okay, so just kind of, it's not a full story, of course. Like, vision is not a solved problem, there's more nuance to it, but I think this narrative can be helpful to kind of like get a perspective of it. So, what? What are the foreseeable consequences of automating vision? So, you can take the, the biological system and ask when did eyes appear? It turns out to appear a very long time ago around uh, just before the Cambrian explosion. And then you can ask like, so, so one evolutionary biology theory is that um, life acquiring perception was a, pre, uh, a necessity for predation. Once you can sense your environment, you can go and get your resources. This creates a competition for life, which, which created the biodiversity. It's just a theory and I'm not, uh, not an expert. But what this highlights is perception as a precondition to a whole other realm of, um, of functionalities. And so, so what? Computers could not see, now they can, so what? I like to think of like consequences of this new automated, uh, automated ability in those four big boxes. And I'll start with the first one. So large scale observation. The idea is that humans are slow at seeing. Now that we can automate seeing, computers can see fast. And so we now have the ability to observe things on a much larger scale. And yeah, this new ability to, so yeah, yeah, this new ability to observe on a large scale is going to give us a quantitative solution to existing problems. So let's say I want to understand the structure of the brain. In order to do that, I have to image at the nanoscale the different cells of the brain to see how they connect to each other. But the brain is about like 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters. So if you ask someone to like go through all this imaging and see what connects to each other, it will take way too long to be physically possible. So in essence, tackling this problem is a problem of vision at large scale. Um, so we do things like this. We do we do we do a bit of neuroimaging. Uh, same problem with observing biodiversity. If you want to check the the health of ecosystems, you want to kind of count what everything is. There's no time to uh, there, there's mostly no money because you have to pay human uh, labor for doing the the visual task. It's another project. So like not only scientific applications. You also have like in most industrial uh, process you have some visual checks that are needed at some point. Um, this is a pro project, a um, strategic innovation program uh, project we have on smart, um, what was the name? Smart logistics, so in which we help like track all uh, old stuff in a warehouse. 
And that's my daughter. Um, so monitoring infrastructure, uh, you have to watch a lot of roads, um, bridges, uh, tunnels, check if there's no cracks. Very, very time consuming. So automating that is great. So observation is a bottleneck to many endeavors, scientific and industrial. Um, being able to uh, do it faster and cheaper opens new doors, basically. It's, it's 10? Seven. It's seven, thanks. OK, um, second box, we have downstream automation. So vision is a prerequisite to movement in uncertain environments. So we've had great cars for a while. Uh, but we're still behind the wheel because if the car doesn't see that someone is crossing the road in front of us, it cannot drive itself. And so the reason why we're talking about automated mobility today is because we've been so successful at perception. Uh, industrial robotic, domestic robotic, there's a lot of uh, application you see there. Um, new quantifications. Uh, basically, you can just kind of like standardize. Uh, humans are good at things, very flexible, but we cannot like quantify a lot of things. So now that you have um, uh, a deterministic way of quantifying things, uh, we that's great for standardization. Another aspect to this new quanti new uh, quanti quantization quantification thing is enlarging the scope of our perceptual abilities. Um, so you have a lot of physical limits to what we're able to observe in terms of size, with light diffraction, in terms of uh, speed, and integrating the learning, the deep learning part into the perception pipelines allow us to kind of push those distances. So I know there's some chemists here, uh, which I wish I, uh, I didn't manage to put the videos in, but for example, one thing we've managed to do is to create a dynamic, dy dy dynamical videos of um, chemical reaction at the nanoscale using um, using electron microscopy, which would not be able to do, we're basically like generating those observations um, using learning. Um, content generation, I'm going to pass on that one, but basically you can create images, uh, many societal implications uh, for this. Just, yeah, so I'll, I'll conclude like this. Uh, I think it's an oversimplified narrative, but I think very efficient to kind of like um, understand what computer vision is and uh, what its impact is currently being. Until a few years ago, machines could not see, now they can, so what? So what I do is develop algorithms for um, computers to extract efficiently information from just like spatially structured data. Um, and I spend a lot of time also wondering of its impact, so just fight, finding the application, kind of making sense of it. We work a lot with industrial partners um, in my academic research, uh, and that's it. Yeah, thank you very much. We are going to proceed with um, a remote presentation by Professor Ralph Davenholt, who is um, currently in Europe, and he is affiliated with the Research Institute for Economics and Business Administration. The title of his presentation is Common Corporate Language in a German-Japanese Joint Venture. Well, I would like to talk about the common corporate language in a Japanese-German joint venture. And before I do so, oh, wait a minute. Um, I have a problem here. Okay. So before I would like to talk about my topic, I would first of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very exciting event. Uh, very interesting to see that some friends of mine are there and um, I'm uh, happy to be with you. I will not talk more than eight minutes. And um, before I start, let me uh, shortly introduce myself. So Ralph Beamrod, and I'm, it, uh, I'm German and I'm Kobe University since 2005. I'm right now in Strasbourg at the hotel. It is raining outside. You see, I have a jacket. It's quite cold here. Well, um, in any way, I would like to start my presentation. So about the common corporate language, in uh, big firms, it is a common problem that uh, many people speak different languages. And there is one idea to implement a common corporate language. That means uh, everyone speaks basically English. And why should they do that? Uh, these firms 
because it has advantages if there's only one language and everyone can communicate with each other. There are some problems, however. Some people are not very well speaking English and others are fluent mother tongue speakers. So in this little thing, in a German-Japanese joint venture, I would like to talk about this issue. And I investigated this with my colleague. And um, we had the German-Japanese um, joint venture in steel mill business. And they implemented this common corporate language as English. So the Germans and the Japanese had to speak in English language. And uh, well, they we uh, collected 144 responses from a questionnaire. And um, we investigated basically this model here. And this model is a um, moderated mediation model. It means that the communication basically mediates the cultural openness of the people to the performance. And at the same time, it uh, moderates the language, moderates cultural openness to communication. So a moderated mediation model. This is one model, one study. And we find out, and that is important now, that the cultural open-minded managers with lower, not with higher language ability, they were the more satisfied people to the communication of the partner side. And I think that is a quite a very interesting um, finding what we have here. And um, we also find that communication satisfaction positively uh, relates to higher perception of the performance. Um, but the first, um, result is the is the break breaking result. Uh, so, and we can see this here in our little uh, moderation graph. So you see that um, on average. So if you take these two graphs together, if you have if a person an employee has a low cultural openness, then they also have low communication satisfaction. So it means low cultural open low satisfaction with the communication. And on the right-hand side, we see that the high cultural open employees, they have a higher communication satisfaction. That makes sense. And the interesting thing is now that we divide these into two groups, into the red one or orange one, with the high language ability and the blue line with the low language ability. And then we can see a big difference and uh, this is quite a striking thing so when you when you think that the blue line might be the japanese and the high language ability people in the orange line are the germans you see that for the high language ability it does not really matter whether the employees are culture open or closed but for the low language ability speaker, so for example, for the Japanese in this joint venture, it matters very much if they are low cultural open or high cultural open. So, and that means, in other words, if you want to find Japanese people for a German Japanese joint venture, for example, then you may want to get high cultural open people in your joint venture. Uh, instead of uh, having a high language ability. So, well, and this is the literature here, and uh, that was my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Um, seven minutes. Yeah. Thank you. You are, yes, you. absolutely. You are perfectly within the, the boundaries. You're actually at the five minute mark. So, that's more than perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, let me have a look if there are any questions. Any questions? Because we have three minutes left from this time. Yes, okay, Michaela? Do I need a mic? Sure, sure. Uh, yes, thank you, Professor, for the presentation. My question is actually how did you measure cultural, cultural openness? In, in your research. Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, let me let me show you this slide here. Um, thank you very much. We measured this. 
in a construct, what is normally, can, can you see this construct? Um, no, it's not visible at the moment. You cannot see the slides? No, I'm afraid oh. not. Good. Um, yeah, you can. Let me let me try again here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Stop sharing. So. Uh, uh, to, uh, um. Wait a minute. Wissenschaft. Okay. Uh, can you see the slide now? Well, in case you you cannot see the slide because it's out now, let me let me tell you very easily. There is a, an, a study by Ang et al. in 2017, and we had the um, questions. So I know that business is done differently in a joint venture partners countries. I'm willing to adapt to international joint ventures partner way of doing things. I'm aware that the norms of business communication are different in our joint venture partner countries. So these kind of questions, um, we had uh, five questions. What we ask about the cultural openness of the people, of the employees, of the managers. Uh, I should say what I didn't say in a, in a presentation. They were all uh, the top managers of this uh, joint venture. So uh, from the German side and from the Japanese side. So all managers who were actually also involved into each other's business. Um, in case you're interested in the paper or anyone is interested in the paper, please tell me. And uh, you did send you please give my email out. And, and I'm very happy to share my paper with you. And it is not yet published. Um, so, um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Agata Wierczbowska, Associate Professor at the Graduate School of Economics, will talk about banks, monetary policy and economic performance in European countries. So I would like to talk about some overview of some of the research topics of my connected to the bank's monetary policy and economic performance. So when we talk about these three points, well, we can talk about uh, many various connections how they influence each other in various ways and we can also study each field separately well for today's presentation i want to focus on three points i've been studying from uh, uh, until now one within the banking system connections between monetary policy and the banking system and impact of the banking system on the economic situation in european countries so for the background well I uh, for the uh, for the background of my research on the banking system, I take first the point that banks are the main source of external finance for private sector in European countries. So uh, they uh, have an impact on the financing conditions and economic situation in uh, these countries and also play important role in the transmission of monetary policy steps to the real economy. Then, well, the second point for the background, well, the global financial crisis, as well as European debt crisis, had huge impact on the bank financial situations. And uh, the role that banks played in this crisis is twofold. They were both source and victims of this crisis. Sorry, not to go into the details, well, when we talk about the uh, position of the banks uh, within the crisis, well, it is connected both to the economic crisis at the time and to the debt crisis and banks were not only influencing causing both of the crisis but also they uh, they felt the negative impact of uh, this crisis so after the crisis well having learned from the situation in uh, 2010s in the european union and also euro area introduced various regulatory and supervisory changes connected to the micro and macro prudential supervision, uh, some directives on the capital requirements and bank recovery and resolution, and also the banking union will uh, be in the uh, uh, euro area. So you can study first, well, what were the impacts of uh, these uh, changes? So we can talk about some positive impacts of the condition and stability of the banking sector in the euro area 
However, some shortcomings, especially the fact that Banking Union is still unfinished project are being pointed out as well. So, well, it is still the field uh, uh, in which you can go on with, uh, with the studying on what should be done to make the Banking Union, let's say, even better than it is right now. Well, another huge event and the impact on the uh, banking sector in Europe, and not only in Europe, was the COVID-19 pandemic. So I've been studying uh, the impact of the pandemic on the bank lending first, so lending to the uh, enterprises and lending to uh, consumers, and uh, looked at the role of the supply and demand conditions and monetary easing, as well as bank financial condition on the lending. Well, on the whole, generally speaking, well, banks in Europe were in pretty good shape before the pandemic, where their four banks also weathered the pandemic pretty well. Well, post-pandemic recent situation sh uh, shows strong capital positions, but some mixed picture for asset quality of the banks. The second point between well, monetary policy and bank lending in Europe, well, after the global financial crisis, well, due to global financial crisis and European debt crisis, European Central Bank introduced various kinds of monetary policy easing, well, interest rate cuts, liquidity provision, and asset purchases, with, which we can see uh, on this slide. So I wanted to study how it affects bank lending in your area countries, as, because as you can see, well, the growth rates in bank lending after the crisis differ pretty uh, a lot across the euro area countries. So, well, what was the impact of ECB non-standard monetary, monetary policy measures on banking system, bank lending? Well, we can see that mostly the impact of the monetary easing was positive, mostly due to well, interest rate cuts, but also supported by some liquidity provision and asset purchase programs. However, I observed uh, considerable differences across euro area countries. So what was the, the determinant of these differences? I looked for some explanations within the uh, banking system of these countries. So on the whole, more positive results of monetary policy easing are in the countries with sound banking system. So if banking system is not working well, then monetary policy also does not have enough positive impact on uh, a bank lending in these countries. However, asset purchase uh, programs were helping also lending in the countries that have strained banking system. So that non-standard policy measures helped the countries that were have suffered uh, due to uh, some uh, crisis. Well, loan demand also was pretty important uh, a factor in the countries. And one more point, something that I ha uh, have just uh, started to study is well, the effect of the banking sector on growth in the euro area countries. So what is the effect of the banking sector size? Well, uh, generally speaking, two large banking sectors tend to uh, affect uh, uh, growth in a negative way. And that negative relation is especially visible during crisis, especially as the European debt crisis and during the pandemic. And how it, that relates to the situation of the banking uh, uh, sector? Well, basically, if banking uh, sector is more stable and uh, banks have better quality of assets balance sheet, that negative impact observed in here tends to be smaller. So, all, well, in the end, it all goes to the fact that banking sector needs to be stable and sound with uh, good quality of assets so that it affects uh, growth in more positive way and also allows the monetary policy to uh, it, it to be transferred uh, into the uh, real economy in a better way so that will be all from me thank you for for your attention let me just say that it's actually three of you today who have um, uh, referred to the covid pandemic uh, Michaela and Agatha, and I think uh, Eva also uh, will talk about the same with reference to economic um, uh, hardships in Europe. Thank you very much for your contribution, and again, we wish you were here next time. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Eva Hanada.
Associate Professor at the Institute for Promoting International Partnerships, will talk about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the banking sectors of EU member states in Central and Eastern Europe. So good evening, everyone, and to the to participants from Europe, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for having me here at this event. It's my first time to participate in this type of event. Uh, my name is Eva Hanada. I'm originally from Slovakia. And today I will talk to you about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the banking sectors of the so-called new EU member states. So I think my topic is very much related also to the previous presentation by Professor Wierzbowska. Unfortunately, I don't have any slides to present myself, but I, can, I just can tell you that very briefly that I came to Japan in 2004 to, start, to do my graduate studies and I joined Kobe University back in 2010. Okay, so in my research, I, I focus on the so-called new member states from Central and Eastern Europe, including Slovakia. And in this research, I try to look at, the, at how the COVID pandemic impacted the banking sectors. As we know, the pandemic had uh, caused many uh, very big transformations and I want to look especially at how how the banking markets of these new so-called new members cope and especially the, the points which I want to look at are to what extent was the resilience of the financial sectors tested and whether we can see differences in intensity between the member states and also what kind of transformation has the pandemic brought for the banking sectors. So very similar to also the, the, to what the previous presenter said, well, we, we have to look also at the pre-pandemic situation and we see that all of these new member states used to have banking sectors which were dominant, dominated by foreign banks. And by foreign banks, I mean especially banks from other EU members. And we, we could see that by the, well, the, the countries which were worst hit by the global financial crisis were Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, followed by Slovenia, Croatia, Hungary and Romania. And then when we look specifically at the bank performance indicators, we can see that even in the countries which were worst hit by the global financial crisis, the balance sheet started to be very sound and uh, stable, especially since 2014 and 15, which is indicated by this type of indicators. Unfortunately, because of time, I do, do not have enough time to go into details, but just to give you one illustration here, we can see how the, how the capital situation of the banks improved since the global financial crisis and this is true for all of the member states and this is mainly due to the all the all very big improvements in the financial regulation and supervision of the eu which is also something which was already mentioned by the previous presenter okay so in the case of the global financial crisis uh, we have seen that uh, the excessive risk taken by banks was one of the causes for the crisis whereas in the pandemic the situation was quite different Certainly the pandemic was a big sudden external shock, uh, but at, at the same time we have seen that uh, the banks were already much better equipped to deal with the situation and of course many, many measures, policy measures have been taken. So what we see is the decline in economic uh, terms. If you compare here, you can clearly see the, well, the big decline in the GDP growth rates during the global financial crisis and then here you have seen that uh, the economic impact of the of the pandemic was big, especially in the first half of 2020. But the impact, we can say, was rather short lived because you can see it was followed by a rebound in 2021 and then certain decline, but not as as uh, as strong as in, we have seen in the in the global financial crisis. And uh, here we have we, we can also just to like demonstrate that initially the shock went to the to the supply side of the real economy and then generated a large demand shock. So let me now focus again on the banking. So what we have seen is that uh, the governments of all these new members took very quick action, and this has to be emphasized. Plus also all the like, institutions like for example EBA, ECB also took many. Uh, very decisive actions and we, we can say that all of the all of these countries also used the, the so-called loan repayment moratorium which is basically support for borrowers that they don't have to pay for the loans for a specific amount of time so this is certainly very beneficial for, for consumers and also for the banks but there is always a, a risk that maybe banks may face uh, amount of undetected non-performing loans after the measures are after the measures expired. So here I'm just showing that the, this type of measure 
was taken by each member state and they varied in the type and timing and also the type of uh, itself. And coming back to the indicators, bank indicators we, we have seen during the pandemic, we can say that certainly uh, we can see the, the impact of the pandemic in some indicators, like for example, decline in the profitability, which is the return on equity. But then we, we can say that uh, this impact tended to be rather short term because we can see that uh, the indicators improved. And I'm showing this in this slide where you can see quite a big difference if you compare the situation in the global financial crisis and then for example Slovenia had its own banking crisis and then you see here the situation during the pandemic which is uh, uh, which is not such to such large extent and well the question remains can we can, what can we what what can we say about the loan moratoria did they lend, did they lead to some to big credit losses are there hidden credit losses for the banks and the latest data I could find for, for this study is from the Vienna Initiative and we can say that from the countries I'm looking at, it seems that Bulgaria and Hungary seems to be at a risk position, so you can see that here in the red zone, because we can say that the share of the non-performing loans is uh, rather high, higher than the average for this, uh, for this area, but here they are actually covering other countries as well, some countries are not, which are not included in my studies, and also the NPL coverage ratio is rather low, which of course increases the risk for the banks. So this is something I want to study in more detail again. And finally, because my time is very limited, very briefly I just highlight the impact of the pandemic because it, it certainly changed the banking quite a lot, especially the accelerated digitalization. So now we clearly see that the banks are moving towards fully digital, flexible banking, and it, it changed basically the ways how the banks interact with customers and it creates more opportunities but also threats such as cyber attacks which we have seen in the financial services and one more trend which has been of course emphasized is a stronger push towards sustainable finance and considerations for environment society and the governance and this is true for the whole of the eu not just for the new member states and as we all know the eu has always been very advanced on these issues so it's also st setting standards for other other, other regions of the world and for example here I'm giving examples of individual banks from this group of the countries that are already leading in these efforts for example to decarbonize the economy and this is uh, this is this is ongoing and will also continue even then even in, even after the pandemic has been over so finally in the conclusion of this study is that basically the banking sectors of these countries prove to be resilient but at the same time, we have to be careful when assessing the, the asset quality because there, there may still be some hidden risk uh, in, the, in terms of the non-performing loans and I want to focus on this in my future study. And last but not least, the pandemic has transformed the banking in many ways when it comes to digitalization and also a stronger move towards sustainable finance. But of course, we need to also uh, look at some latest set of challenges such as the war conflict of Ukraine because some of these countries are more exposed to the, to the region than others and the implications for their banks. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. The uh, wealth of uh, um, scholarship is uh, basically what we have been presented here today. I truly appreciate your time and uh, and your enthusiasm with which you prepared uh, today's slides. Those of you who have um, taken up positions, jobs at Kobe University have showed to others that there are actually multiple ways to take root in Japan, to actually uh, grow in your uh, careers. And there are multiple ways in which you can actually uh, become prosperous and successful in this country. Uh, although, myself included, we have European origins, but at the same time, I think most of us can call Japan our second home, uh, as we've been here for several years. And uh, this should also give an inspiration to uh, newcomers who are about to start uh, their careers and, and jobs, so even studies in this country. And thank you for all your contributions. I wish you a successful continuation of your careers and a wonderful summer ahead. Thank you so much.